Okay, so we're going to do locking here. And you'll see uh, the joys of, of locking. Um, so if I, and, and you know, I can do this operation transformation as, lo as, as, as long as I know about indices and characters being inserted. But if all I know about is mass events, I can't do OT, okay, operation transformation. And in such a situation, if you really want concurrency control, you have to go to locking. Okay? And that's exactly what's happened. That, um, um, how many of you have used Skype to, with, uh, to share your desk with other people? Is, is, is there a locking protocol in Skype? How, how, how do you make sure that, is there, have, you, have, you tried, have, you, have you seen any locking capabilities? All the early systems I saw had locking. And just to give you an idea of why locking is important, just imagine that I go and press a button here to do the mouse down, mouse down. Okay? Uh, I, 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 I click, uh, I go and press a character A and I just press the key without releasing it, or I press the mouse button, I, 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 uh, I don't release it. At the same time, you go and press it, uh, press it. So you press the button before I release it. The application is going to see two mouse presses without a release. A lot of applications, will, at least the old ones, used to just die when that happened. Because the application is totally unaware of the fact that there are multiple users. The application is just getting a stream of clicks. Some clicks come from me, some clicks come from you. And if those clicks don't make sense, then this is, it's, it's going to be a problem. So that is why people had floor control, at least in the old systems that I understand, X window system, where when I press a button, um, I better release it before somebody else presses it. That means I better have the lock during that period. Okay? And that's exactly what's happening here. So if I go and press the button here, nothing is happening because I don't have, nobody has a lock here. Okay? So we have an extra window here and I'm going to say request lock. Since nobody else has a lock, I have the lock and everybody else sees that I have the lock in this implementation. And now I go and press the button and it's a, a, a click and it's being followed. Okay? And if I want to go in here and do something, nothing happens. I can, as Bob, request the lock. Kathy can see this lock request and decide, well, I'm done or I'm not done. You can release the lock at this point. And now Bob can request the lock and Bob can. Okay? Cumbersome. Okay, as long as we have big transactions that I do the actions for a while, then you do the actions, you know, this is going to work. Okay, but if you're going to have very small transactions, it's going to be an issue. Okay? And if you want that, if you want to have back and forth, maybe you can do, how can you imagine improving this interface? And what you see on the screen is giving you a hint. Implicit locking, what might that mean? So like if I'm currently typing something, I have a lock and you can't take it from me, but if I stop typing for a certain amount of time, then I automatically release the lock. So that's implicit locking and implicit unlocking, right? And implicit locking is, is safe, okay? That just means that transaction was executed implicitly, uh, was requested implicitly. Implicit unlocking is a big step. The database guys are just going to jump and say, no, your, your data are not consistent. You know, just because you, you know, you, you had, was, you went to a cup, have a cup of coffee, okay, you've released the lock, and, and, and so that's called tickle lock, and somebody at MIT invented it and said, it's okay, and, 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 and so people started doing that, okay? So this is, that's, so this is what we're going to do now. We're going to say implicit lock, okay? Now when I go and press, automatically a lock request is generated. And it's saying, Kathy's requesting the lock you hold. Who's the, I release the lock as Bob. Now I go in here and Kathy gets the lock. Okay? So, and again, you can have implicit unlocking also. And, and like I said, you know, in some of the initial research and collaboration technology was all about various locking protocols. Okay? Maybe you need a vote on who gets the next lock. I mean, there was just all these interesting kinds of algorithms one could come up with that are distributed. And, the reason I want, I like this implement, uh, this, this particular uh, assignment is that you have to come up with a nice coordination mechanism to exchange locks. Okay, so you really understand uh, your, your distributed programming experience uh, improves. Okay, now um, this kind of technology with locking more closely simulates remote desktop. 
right? What happens in remote desktop? If I go and uh, project this screen on, on um, the desktop, show this desktop on my laptop, this desktop will get blackened, right? And I will be able to enter in my laptop. And, and it's not possible for me to log on there and here. And if I go to another laptop, this, uh, then, uh, then, I then this particular session will not be allowed. Okay, I've never tried it, but they just want, uh, want to allow only one stream of interaction at one time. Okay? And, and that's pretty much what concurrency control is. And uh, let me just show this to you more dramatically. So I'm going to simulate remote desktop so that only one user can interact at any one time, which is what remote desktop is, and that's a special case of this. So if Kathy releases the lock, nobody's got the lock, so essentially nobody's using the, looking at the desktop. Now, if Bob requests a lock, Bob sees the display, Bob can do some action, and then Bob can release the lock, which means move to another computer, and, and now I, if I release the lock here, I see it. If I request the lock, I see the action. Okay, so you really see the UI migrating from one computer to the other. Okay? In remote desktop, the UI, uh, in the remote desktop, is a little different from what's happening here. Because if I'm running PowerPoint on, on my desktop and I'm viewing it on my laptop, where's the PowerPoint? The PowerPoint is running only on the desktop. The PowerPoint is not running on my, on my local laptop. Okay? There's only one application running. Here, we have a different architecture, which is the replicated architecture, which fails under more conditions, as it turns out. We'd see that. Where uh, everybody's running the PowerPoints and the PowerPoints displays are, keep, are keeping consistent. Okay? So you can imagine true migration here, I start my project, I, I'm editing something or I'm drawing something on my desktop, I have to go to the plane, I continue the session on my laptop and I finish the drawing there and then when I'm in line in the, in, in the airport waiting for a boarding pass, I, I transfer, the, transfer the interaction to my, my mobile computer perhaps, okay? my smartphone. So th with replicated architecture, you can see this kind of migration and again you see now some relationship between collaboration computing and mobile computing. Okay, so, so, uh, so that's a possibility. Okay. Um.